Bonjour à toutes et tous. Bonjour good morning, participants. everyone, and good morning to the participants that have joined us. Uh, now you're connected from different continents, and we want to wish you a very warm welcome. I know my name is Louis Magnard. Uh, I am a project officer in the uh, Education Solidarity Network, and I'm opening on behalf of Matthias Savignac, who was not able to join us today, unfortunately. I am welcoming you to this seminar. In four days, on the 12th of December, we'll have the International Day or the World Day for Universal um, uh, health coverage, which was adopted four years ago by the Assembly General of the United Nations. Now, of course, um, universal health coverage means that all people, all communities will benefit from health care as they need without having to have any kind of financial constraints. It uh, covers the whole range of quality health services for the promotion of health, prevention, treatments, but also access to medication to uh, efficient, uh, secure, safe, and affordable vaccines. The 12th of December 2021 will be uh, one the first anniversary of the climate um, Youth uh, a Summit of the UN and uh, climate change was identified as one of the emergencies. It is a date that reminds us of uh, the need to make this human rights a reality, to make sure that we need to have a strong, resilient health system everywhere in the world and to have everywhere social protection for health purposes and make sure that everybody has a universal health coverage. Now, this is at the heart of the third uh, SDG, which had been adopted by the Assembly General of uh, uh, United Nations and that we need to reach uh, uh, until 2030. Now, a lot of progress have been made in terms of health uh, coverage. More than a third of the world uh, uh, population, however, does not have access to essential health services. And every year, 100 million people then find themselves in extreme poverty because of the circumstances. Now, this is the reason why we have today the Education Solidarity Network. It was created 12 years ago to the initiative of three organi organizations in the health, education, and social protection sectors, the MGN, Mutuelle Générale de l'Éducation Nationale, the Association Internationale de la Mutualité, AIM, and the uh, Education International, with the support of the International Labor Office. At the beginning, of course, uh, or at the heart of this network, there are several ideas. Yes. First of all, education and health are interdependent. Health is essential for quality education, and education can improve the health and well being of people because it does guarantee, in a sustainable manner, the development of communities. Second idea, the education actors are the ambassadors, the defenders of health and social protection issues and the values of democracy, equality, and solidarity. And our association has a, a for objective a bridge building between the actors of education and health in every territory beyond our borders so as to make sure that we ensure the well-being of communities and also for the creation of a social protection culture and the extension of solidarity-based social protection systems. 12 years of collaboration, a pandemic afterwards now. Uh, I know that all the members of the network are insured, uh, are aware of the fact that solidarity is the response to the crisis that we're going through. We will need to go on cooperating at the international level so as to make sure that we have universal health coverage. Education, the Education and Solidarity Network is present in five continents with more than 40 organizations uh, that unite around the values of education, of democracy, of solidarity, nonprofit. And we have also health and mutual societies, educational societies, uh, uh, organizations for, uh, of course, uh, solidarity, and other civil society organizations to make sure that health services are accessible, uh, that uh, you will have access to health care at the youngest age, and that education is for all, and that uh, the younger generations can take care of their own uh, future. On all of these topics, one of the missions of the Education Solidarity Network is to make sure that the world organizations can come together and think together, even though we are doing this remote. 
we want to be a platform, but also a spokesperson for all these organizations, for their ideas, their actions, so as to be a source of inspiration for other organizations and the implementation of other initiatives. This year, the network has uh, uh, wanted to mobilize its members and partners on the issue of youth in action on health for the promotion of EUHC and the fight against climate change in the framework of an international exchange of ideas. Our message is the following. Everywhere in the world, young people are mobilizing for universal access to health. Together, we can indeed make sure that universal health coverage becomes a reality. In order to implement your initiatives, or, or rather to shed a light on your initiatives, we have launched a call uh, for candidates and we invited the members of the network uh, to uh, indeed uh, present uh, through a video an initiative of a solidarity action. Now we have uh, three initiatives that we've selected and that we will present to you later on. Through this webinar, what we want to do is that you travel around the world and that you see the health solidarity initiatives uh, because we want to exchange best practices and our experiences and we'll discover initiatives um, that are promoted by young people in the uh, solidarity economy and by uh, civil society organizations on the promotion of health, uh, universal health coverage and the fight against climate change. Now, of course, uh, these are topics that uh, we have an interest uh, uh, on among all the organizations of the network. Now we have intergenerational international exchanges. And through these exchanges, we want to make sure that we put to your uh, service uh, sources of inspiration that will help you put together new initiatives, new actions for cooperation. So on behalf of Education Solidarity Network, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers that are going to take the floor, uh, to the floor today, Dianala, Emma, Shaima, and Omeima. Thank you to Aurore Iradukonda, of our oldest partners of the International Labour Organization. Thank you for being with us, uh, Aurore. And finally, I would like to thank a colleague from another founding organization of uh, the Education Solidarity Network, Jessita Carino, who is the coordinator of uh, promotion of health, uh, environmental health, and prevention of diseases. Uh, of the International Association of Mutual Benefit Societies. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for moderating this uh, workshop or this webinar. And thank you all of you for your participation. Thanks so much, Judith, and uh, thanks uh, to, the, to the Education and Solidarity Network for inviting uh, me to moderate. I think that the, the topics that you mentioned, be it uh, climate change, universal access to healthcare, are uh, very timely issues. Um, and the event that you're organizing is also a, a timely event. Um, I think it's no uh, coincidence that the Commission uh, declared that 2022 was the year of youth, because I'm convinced that uh, really involving uh, and engaging youth in tackling those big challenges is essential. And events like the one you're organizing today um, are key in order to mobilize uh, and in order to inspire people to take action. So uh, before digging into the topic, I have to give you some technical um, instructions. So as you might have seen, the event is uh, translated into three languages, uh, English, French, and Spanish. You can access the interpretation by clicking on the globe that is below your screen and choosing the correct language. Uh, we would also like this event to be as interactive as possible, so please do send us uh, your questions uh, via the chat. You can also share with us any initiative that you have been uh, carrying out in your countries. And we also invite you to raise your hand in order to take the floor. Um, I will be uh, checking the hands and giving you the floor during the Q&A. Uh, so that means after the three uh, presentations of best practices. Um, so uh, before we hear from these uh, inspiring best practices, I would like um, to have a short poll uh, in order to get to know you a bit better, or audience better. Um, so the poll is, uh, I think, um, Chloe, you will uh, launch that poll. So we would like to know how old you are actually. Are you uh, under 20, uh, from 20 to 25 or 24, 25 to 30, 30, 35? Or 35 plus, I invite you to click on the correct uh, uh, answer. Oh, 
Okay. Some answers coming in. I invite more people to answer maybe. We have quite a balanced uh, audience, I see. No, no people under 20 so far. Uh, more be, uh, above 35, so we we are the older, older but not old. I have to underline. Um, so it's nice. I hope that the examples that you would hear you will hear from today will inspire you. And uh, well, I suggest that we start with our uh, first um, example. Before doing that, I want to highlight that for each example, you will hear first of all you will watch a short video introducing the example, followed by a presentation by one or two representatives. Uh, of the youth movement. You will see that you will hear uh, mainly from women. So I'm very happy that the gender will be rightly represented uh, in today's event. Uh, so the first example is a national one and the other ones are uh, international examples. Um, so the first one, as I mentioned, is national and it comes all the way from Colombia um, where a mutual mutual set carries out uh, activities uh, via its program Ser Joven, which uh, literally means uh, being young. Uh, and it's a program um, that aims to tackle the risks uh, posed to the health of younger generations. Um, I will not give you much more information on it. I will leave it to Daniela Viana, who is our youth representatives, uh, who is speaking on behalf of Mutuaset. So Daniela, you, you have the floor after the short video that we will show. Hola, soy Daniela Viana, colombiana de la ciudad de Cartagena de Indias y la iniciativa que hoy represento es el programa Ser Joven de Mutual Ser EPS. Mutual Ser es una organización que nació en los Montes de María, en la región caribe de mi país, en el año 1991 y que hoy asegura 2.500.000 afiliados en nuestra región, asegura sus servicios de salud y por medio de nuestra organización, que además es una organización de economía solidaria, nace el programa Ser Joven, el cual busca minimizar los riesgos a los cuales se ven enfrentados los jóvenes de nuestra organización. Desde el programa Ser Joven garantizamos atención integral y enfocada a la salud sexual y reproductiva de nuestros jóvenes de 10 a 24 años en busca de que tomen decisiones libres, informadas y conscientes, ya que en esta edad tan difícil para nosotros los jóvenes y a todos los desafíos que nos vemos enfrentados, lo más importante para Mutual Ser es prestar una atención a los jóvenes en de los cuales se sientan identificados. ¿Cómo lo hacemos? De una manera lúdica llegando a los jóvenes a los de los diferentes municipios por medio de la unidad amigable, que en nuestro caso son las unidades móviles. Por otro lado, la creación de los nuevos liderazgos la hacemos por medio de talleres edu educativos que impulsan a que los jóvenes de nuestra organización creen su proyecto de vida y que por medio de ese puedan estar enfocados en, lo, en el camino que quieren seguir. Uno de los resultados que puedo hoy contarles es que la tasa de embarazo en Colombia es del 22% y los jóvenes de nuestra organización en Mutual Ser es el 13%. Entonces, esto significa que, bueno, algo, algo tenemos de resultado en esta tarea. Desde Mutual Ser EPS y el programa Ser Joven nos unimos a la conmemoración del Día Internacional de la Cobertura Sanitaria Universal con la motivación, con el impulso de seguir trabajando cada día el mejor servicio de salud posible y que siempre, siempre nuestra motivación sea atenderlos de la mejor manera posible y sin tanta vuelta.
Buen día a todos. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it perfectly. So as I pointed out in the video, my name is Daniela Viana, and I'd like to present the Mutual Ser Initiative. It's an organization that we founded already 20 years ago in the Maria Mounts in the Caribbean region of my country. We have more than 1,500 affiliates and we're part of the social economy. We have thousands of affiliates that are found in this region in Colombia that has more than 8,000 inhabitants. We, everything started in 1993 due to the changes in the Colombian constitution where entities that regulate health can be cooperatives and mutuals. And this is why we have been able to carry out these initiatives from then on up until this date. In 2014, a group of young people decided to meet and look at what we could do for our region and how we could improve our life projects and how we could carry out different projects with regards to adolescent pregnancies, um, reproductive um, health and so forth. And, and these have been our main initiatives, starting with the prevention of adolescent pregnancies or teenage pre pregnancies. And then secondly, looking into life projects, how can we supports the youth to take informed decisions and then thirdly to promote healthy lifestyles a healthy young person can take on any challenge any project and this is why we really want to work on this we decided to focus on health um, services for teenagers and young people between 14 and 20 four years that are between 14 and 24 years old in our region and we try to support them in their life um, projects to promote healthy lifestyles. Our specific objectives are the following. It's true that we've been able to evolve with this program and change it a lot. But the main objective is to identify a series of risks so that we can clearly identify different types of users. So we have um, characterization form, which can be filled in to obtain more information on sexual life, uh, suicidal ideas, user of, of drugs or psychoactive uh, substances, so that we can clearly define uh, the fields in which we could work with the youth. We also try to work with different networks in order to promote sexual and reproductive um, health, prevent adolescents or teenage pregnancies, and then look also look into family life, cultural activities, sport activities, and we want to prevent um, subsequent pregnancies because we noticed that young people that were of 15 years of age that had already been pregnant with 15 had more chances of becoming pregnant again in um, at 17 years old. We decided to, to work with contraceptives and subdermal implants, which has proved to be very effective. So how do we work? We try to create interactive workshops, have different forums that can be enjoyed by the youth. You can see one of the forums that we had organized about three months ago in a region. And we also have these mobile units that allow us to really reach out to the places where we find young people in Colombia. We're in contact with them. We try to, to reach out to them. So Ser Joven really tries to, to reach out to them, to get to them uh, so that they become parts of our program, part and parcel of our program. As part of our educational serv services, we have a network and a cycle that starts with the parents, 
we also reach out to the schools, training centers. We teach parents how to have more assertive communication with their sons and daughters. We do training programs. Um, we also have support networks. We have intersectorial alliances. We try to have support from the state because otherwise it's a lot more difficult to take on in these activities. And I want to stress that all of these initiatives need to have support from the health and education ministries of our country because they enable us to have initiatives that are much more productive for the youth and this makes them a lot more effective. We also have days on um, sexual and reproductive health and we try to have sports activities as well as part of these programs. We also have medical consultation, uh, a nursing, uh, prescription for a blood test. What is the uh, current situation in uh, uh, teenager pregnancies? It's 11%. Here we compare it uh, with the um, 22%, which is the national average, and in 100% of the places where we have the program uh, young, uh, the rate is below 17%. How do we do it uh, with uh, subdermis implants? In 2021, we've uh, had 1,500 of these implants. Uh, we've had 1,086 users uh, with uh, remissions in mental health. Uh, so from the first appointments, so we realized that these uh, uh, young people need uh, specific support in mental health. Uh, young people in support networks uh, to support them in mental health, uh, in uh, sexual um, reproductive health. And my message in this uh, World Day of Universal Health coverage, I will tell you a little bit how our um, health system works in Colombia. We have a universal coverage horizontally. Health is for everyone uh, without obstacles uh, for everybody in our country, regardless of uh, their economic situation. They have the right uh, to access uh, health services without uh, restrictions. Uh, we have two regimes, uh, the regime for the most vulnerable people in our country and the contribution uh, regime that uh, that is for those uh, who are working. Our strategy is uh, attention without uh, going around and around. That means without bureaucracy, without going from one office to the other. Just uh, making life easier for our users. On top of all this, vertically, we have the system uh, which is the coverage we have uh, in Colombia and we reach 95% uh, in health services in our country and I say it with uh, pride, nobody loses all its money because of uh, using health uh, services. And this is something that I wanted to tell uh, today because we're talking about this uh, universal coverage for all the people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation and, and thanks for this very uh, vivid example of how to uh, really... <laughs> thanks thanks for um yes so i, I was saying it's a really uh, a good example of how to empower uh, youth to take um to improve their own health but also the health of their whole community uh, by uh, making them really actors of their own health and by also creating leadership for for change um, so our, a second example also seeks to promote the voices of youth and to provide them with a platform to discuss their problems and to find uh, solutions together, be it uh, relating to discrimination, climate change, or universal uh, access to healthcare. 
um, as is the topic of today's uh, event. So uh, we will hear uh, from uh, two representatives of the Geneva Youth Call, Emma Lieflang, who will also be speaking in the video, and she will be accompanied uh, for the presentation by Eva Luvisotto. So thanks to both for taking part to today's event. Um, I now um, give the floor to you both uh, after the short video. Resilient health systems. Hello, my name is Emma Liefland. I'm 20 years old. I'm half Armenian and half Dutch, and I currently live in Geneva, Switzerland. For me, the fact that mental health is gaining more and more legitimacy in a world where we mainly talk about physical health is a huge and long overdue step forward. However, I remain dismayed by the lack of access to a safe and effective health care system that some people suffer from currently and for many years, even in some very developed countries. I consider inaccessibility to healthcare today to be unacceptable and one of the problems that humanity must quickly remedy to. To this end, I am a member of the Geneva Youth Call, a growing project whose existence is dedicated to promoting the voices of the youth on current global and local issues such as discrimination, climate change and health. By putting forward the voices of the youth, we want to help them feel included and useful in solving problems. These problems, young people can denounce them on our virtual platform by filling in a contribution and announcing a problem no matter how small or important it is, to give it visibility. It is also possible to propose solutions on this platform in order to integrate young people in their rightful place in the decision-making process. Currently, we are working on a global youth charter an innovative document which breaks the codes and really allows young people to implement their ideas in decision-making processes and the conceptualizations of solutions. We're also working on a World Youth Assembly, which will take place in Geneva, allowing us to bring together the denunciation of problems and the search for solutions in one place. Thanks to your active and dynamic youth, decision-making and exchange promises to be a success. As for our results, they are promising. We already have a good number of contributions, some of which concern unequal access to health care, mental health, reproductive health, or even the management of hospital units. This shows us that health is of universal importance and it is an issue to which young people are particularly sensitive to. In concrete terms, our project is a project that embraces the ideas, ideals, and goals of the youth, one of whose priorities is the promotion of a supportive and effective health care system. To conclude, I would like to encourage you to get involved in promoting universal health coverage, whether it's through our, our initiative or not. <laughs> I would like to end with an Italian proverb. He who has health is rich without knowing it. My mother used to tell me that health is the most precious thing we have. Um, help us share this wealth with the world. Thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So let me share my screen and here we are. Okay, so as you heard it, we are the Geneva Youth School or representative of Geneva Youth School. And I will uh, let uh, Emma speak uh, very shortly about herself. So you've met me before on the video. So my name is Emma. I am a third year student in international relations at the University of Geneva. And I have been part of the GYC, so Geneva Youth Call for about a year now. Thank you, and I'm Eva. I'm the co-creator of Geneva Youth School. I'm 40, uh, 24, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, I'm currently an intern uh, at the UN. And I would describe myself as pretty optim optimistic, sometimes a bit too much, but <laughs> it's why uh, we created Geneva Youth School. Before going on, could we uh, launch the survey? Would it, would it be possible? Yes, great. Uh, 
Great. So uh, maybe Emma, do you want to go ahead and explain? Yeah, so we've prepared a little survey. Um, so you can all vote right now. We'll give you a couple of seconds to vote. So the question is, um, what do you think was the percentage of the world population aged less than 24 years old in 2018? So you have a couple of seconds to vote and then we can discuss the results together. Okay, I think that we are good. I don't see it changing anymore. Not a lot. <laughs> so thank you so much for launching the, the survey, Jessica. It seems that um, most of you think that uh, the good answer is 54%. Um, uh, Do you want to comment on that? Uh, it's, I think a lot of people think oh, no. it was 36%. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the real answer is actually 41%, which is actually interesting because it represents almost half our population. Um, and so this is particularly interesting to us for two reasons. The first reason is that this means that um, a lot of the people that are in positions that they can take decisions in, you know, in businesses and the UN or in the workplace, people are taking important decisions that are going to affect the youth in the future. Um, those are not young people. Those are people that are 40, 50, 50 years old, 60 years old. Um, and so it's interesting to us because it means that the decisions that they take are not always representative of how the youth feels. And that's important because almost half of the population is the youth. Um, so that's really interesting to us because it's even more important to be able to represent the opinion of the youth because it's such a huge part of, of the population. Um, so that was just an interesting mm -hmm. fact. <laughs> and of course, it makes the link with what comes next. And before explaining uh, what is Geneva Youth School and how it works, really, I wanted to talk about how did we end up with Geneva Youth School? Because at the very beginning of this project, then we realized a very basic thing, but there is no common place worldwide for the youth to debate, create solution, get involved. And we were, we were quite uh, surprised at that, that it does not exist and we need it, of course. The second aspect that was really important to us is that we, we have a voice, we have uh, social networks and everything, but we do not want to wait to be adult, to be involved, to create, to think, and to feel that we can act in this world. So we want to promote solution making, solution process also for youth. And the last thing is what we call universal principles. And um, I, I do agree that there is no such thing, no such thing as being universal because we will always find somebody disagreeing but what we want to um, mean by universal is everything that do no harm and that is positive intrinsically like uh, promoting um, human rights and respect and, and peace so now let's uh, with all these values we had the idea of Geneva your school and I will let Emma explain it a, a little bit deeper deeply I can so those are the four key objectives of the GYC. So the first one, and I think that's the one we're particularly proud of, is the virtual platform. So the idea of this platform is to collect um, the opinions, um, ideas, solutions, and the problems that are expressed by the youth and um, create a synergy in between all of them. And so the idea is that anyone can propose a solution and anyone could propose or talk about a problem. And this allows all young people to um, converse on subjects, um, whereas I don't feel as you have so many platforms that allow you to do so. And it also facilitate, facilitates finding solutions um, and maybe implementing them. So this leads me to my second, our second objective, which is um, hosting a World Youth Assembly. And um, if you go on our website here, you might actually hear about um, the assembly we're organizing in April. And so the idea of this, of this assembly is to actually bring together in one place um, problem denouncing and solution finding. Finding, And this actually gives us the opportunity to um, 
find solutions in a way that is usually not um, given to the youth, if that makes sense. It's, it's very interactive and um, it really allows us to bring together the youth. Um, so our second, our third, um, um, sorry, our third objective is the Youth Solution Charter, which is going to be very, it's a very original, creative, um, and I would say daring <laughs> document um, that has a very um, particular um, form. So we call it a solution wheel, and you have an example on the, um, on the PowerPoint. And so the idea is to actually um, inspire, be inspired um, of the solutions proposed by the youth um, on the platform and discuss during the youth assembly. And so the idea is to highlight and connect to initiators and the operators of solutions and to facilitate the implementation of solutions. So our last point is an educational program, which looks a little less related to the rest of what we talked about, but this is also very important because it's very important to, to us to sensibilize the youngest on current global issues and to teach them how to become critical thinkers, how to become um, change makers, how to become people that want to find solutions. And it's also to help them to think about those solutions in an original way. And so we do this through workshops and um, educational programs. Um, this slide is not to show off, but um, we are still at the beginning of a big process, right? Uh, doing something worldwide is uh, such a long project and a heavy project. But we have already met so interesting people like Tatiana Zalovaya, which is the director of the UN or in Geneva, or Shama Sandoyar, who is the climate activist that made a climate strike under the sea, underwater, sorry. <laughs> so um, it's some example because we met people that were also uh, got involved in project and uh, began to create things with other communities of youth. So this is just to show that only the process of thinking widely of thinking, what can we do with the youth and how can we get to the aim of doing something concrete and not only talking about human rights. Because as an intern, I can see that the UN is wonderful. We're always talking about peace and human rights and all these wonderful things, but it's kind of frustrating not to be able to do something concrete. And going through this process of thinking concretely, we do things concretely, even though we don't have the product of what we are aiming to. And what is the link between Geneva School and this webinar. Actually, one of our main themes, themes is health, uh, of course, because health is really important and is related to uh, each of all the other themes that we are covering. Of course, if there are conflicts, there, there will be health issues like we can see in Afghanistan right now or in Yemen, etc. Same for education and environment and all these other themes. And it's really important for us to cover these themes as well. And last but not least, we already have some proposition. And today, if you have an idea, if you witness a problem, or if you have a solution, you can go on our website and share with us a solution, a problem about health or any other topic that I just mentioned or showed. And that's the beginning of the big process to change the world. <laughs> um, now, because I want to hear from you as well, right? Our project is also about communicating with you. Um, I would like to know, and you can write in the chat or interact or anything you would like to know um, what should be changed uh, related to health issues or something that is uh, linked to it. Maybe if, if Emma, you want to add anything, go ahead. I think we're, I'm, I'm good. I think I, I really want to hear about your ideas. So don't feel shy. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot to both. So uh, an assignment, homework to do for the people who are watching this. So if you have, um, if you can share your, your ideas via the chat of what still needs to be changed, I guess that there's a lot um, related to health, healthcare, uh, access to healthcare. I think it's, it, the, the initiative that you presented, I think the Geneva Youth Call um, is really, um, I think it's really nice to see how youth mobilizes around all those important issues. And also to see that actually those issues are, 
are, as we said before, the, the biggest challenges for the years to come. I mean, I saw the, the topics that you showed, the wheel, it really reminds me of the reminds me of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, everything is there. So it's very encouraging to see that youth mobilizes for those important issues. Um, I want to move to our uh, last example now. So it's from the NGO One, whose activities actually mostly rely on young ambassadors, uh, like the ones who we'll be hearing from today. So One is also committed to achieving equal access to healthcare for all. And they have uh, notably been active on the issue of uh, access to COVID a vaccine in the context of the pandemic. So I'm very looking forward to uh, hearing more about this from uh, our two representatives, Ms. Omeima Balul and Shaima Taib. So uh, ladies, I now give you the floor after the short video. Bonjour, je m'appelle Omeima, j'ai 23 ans, je vis à Angers et depuis deux ans je suis jeune ambassadrice pour l'ONG One, une ONG de campagne et plaidoyer qui lutte contre l'extrême pauvreté et les maladies évitables. J'ai rejoint One car je suis persuadée que l'endroit où on est ne devrait pas déterminer nos chances de survie, du fait de l'accès ou non aux soins de santé nécessaires. La pandémie du Covid-19 a davantage mis en lumière l'importance de ce droit. Par définition, lors d'une pandémie, le virus ne s'arrête pas aux frontières et circule à travers le monde. Pour l'endiguer, une coopération internationale est donc nécessaire. Malheureusement, la réalité est tout autre. Si dans les pays riches, on commence à retrouver progressivement un rythme et un style de vie pré-pandémie, notamment grâce aux campagnes de vaccination massive, dans plusieurs pays à faible revenu, l'accès au vaccin est encore minime et le virus représente encore une forte menace ainsi qu'un frein majeur aux activités économiques. Pour vous donner un exemple concret, le taux de vaccination en France atteint 75% contre seulement 6% en Afrique. Cela est non seulement injuste, mais aussi irresponsable. Tant que le virus continuera de circuler, même loin de chez nous, il risque de muter, de rendre les vaccins inefficaces et de revenir paralyser nos sociétés. C'est pour cela que chez One, on est mobilisé depuis des mois pour demander aux dirigeants et dirigeantes de garantir un accès mondial et équitable au vaccin Covid-19. Notre action en tant que jeune ambassadeur et ambassadrice présente deux volets que je vais vous présenter. D'une part, des actions de plaidoyer pour convaincre nos dirigeants à prendre position et à agir de manière concrète en faveur de l'accès au vaccin, ce qui permettra aux pays à faible revenu d'accélérer les campagnes de vaccination à destination de leur population. Cela passe notamment par le partage de doses, le financement de mécanismes internationaux, la levée temporaire des droits de propriété intellectuelle, le transfert de technologies, etc. D'autre part, nous agissons également via des campagnes de sensibilisation du grand public dans le but d'unir nos voix et d'utiliser le pouvoir de mobilisation citoyenne pour faire pression sur nos dirigeants. Vous pouvez par exemple signer notre pétition sur notre site one.org. Lors du dernier G20, en octobre 2021, les dirigeants se sont mis d'abord sur l'objectif de vacciner 70% de la population de chaque pays d'ici septembre 2022. Cependant, ils n'ont pas précisé les moyens pour y parvenir, d'où la nécessité de poursuivre nos efforts pour qu'on puisse tous et toutes vaincre ce virus. Que ce soit au bout de la rue ou à l'autre bout du monde, l'accès au vaccin ainsi qu'aux soins ne devrait pas être une question de privilège, mais un droit fondamental, reconnu et protégé. Et ce n'est qu'en se mobilisant ensemble qu'on y parviendra. Together as one. Bonjour à tous. Euh, c'est très bizarre de se voir. So, en... Hi everyone. It's very very weird to see oneself in the video and to listen to oneself. So thank you. So my name is Omeima, as I said in the video, and I'm today uh, with uh, Shaima. Hi. Hi everyone. 
So we are young ambassadors at ONE, as I said. So what is ONE? It's an NGO that was created in uh, 2004, uh, among others by Bono, the singer of uh, U2, to end extreme poverty and, uh, of course, uh, uh, diseases uh, in Africa, among others. So it is an advocacy and a campaign NGOs. So that means that we don't bring material support directly to populations. What we do is we uh, call on political leaders so that they can take measures and they launch international programs that will then benefit the local populations that need it most. So we are going to rely on the power of a citizens' mobilization so as to put pressure on our leaders. At one, well, what we have the Young Ambassadors uh, program uh, that has been presented. And in 2021, we have been able to really unite 320 young ambassadors uh, of 30 nationalities in six countries France, Belgium, UK, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands. So, what is it? It is a volunteer uh, program that lasts for a year, and you have passionate young activists that have the means then to really call on political leaders both at local and at global level so as to make sure that the actions of one can be conveyed to the medias and to the political leaders at European national and local level. So what are our tools? Well, of course, it's important to uh, make sure that we know our mission, our vision, our values, our advocacy model. So before we go and see an MP, what we're going to do is perhaps we're going to see a little bit what this MP is defending. Is it linked uh, to what one defends? Uh, and then we work on the more practical competences, tips. Uh, for instance, in one, we have advocacy seminars, media workshops, as to know how to communicate with political leaders because as young people, of course, we're not used to going to our MPs and talking to them. And this is how one has been able to train 2,000 young ambassadors in the four corners of Europe. And here you see that within our uh, campaign for access to uh, the vaccines, uh, we were able to use all these tools for citizens' mobilizations. There are petitions that you will find on our website, one.org. You've got like posters, campaigns, media. Uh, for instance, we mobilize ourselves, we're at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, we uh, look, send letters to our political leaders, uh, we also have internal events, uh, so as to better define our priorities, for instance, uh, better um, connect to, for instance, people in Africa, we have our uh, information newsletters, interviews in uh, the media, in order to raise awareness around the topics and to talk to other young people, so as to make sure that we can uh, convey their messages as well. Here you see some of the actions that we've been able to carry out this year. So um, we have mobilized ourselves for the education, especially for young girls and girls. We drafted letters addressed to the president and we launched an action in Paris, in France. We organized stands in schools and universities. We had advocacy uh, meetings with local representatives, but also with Uta Urbaleinin, the commissioner, I hope I didn't kill her name, which is of course the commissioner in charge of international partnerships. And all this mobilization uh, has been fruitful because this year, for instance, uh, there were several commitments that were taken by President Emmanuel Macron, for instance, the commitment to share 120 million doses of vaccine, also to suspend the intellectual property rights and the transfer of technology to Africa. But, but of course, there are some promises that have not been filled for the moment, for instance, as regard to uh, the um, financing of the access to COVID-19 tools, accelerating the ACTA uh, mechanism and also uh, the waiving of uh, IPRs for vaccines. Now, as regards to health, uh, well, we have mobilized ourselves uh, so as to ensure uh, fair and global access to COVID-19 vaccines. Access to the vaccine is very unfair and very unequal between high income and low uh, income countries. Now, this is our uh, diagram from our Africa Travel.
traffic. Now, we know that 7.7% of the African population is entirely vaccinated. That's the red line, whereas in the uh, uh, higher income uh, in countries, we have an average of 64% of the population that's been vaccinated. This is a huge gap, fully vaccinated, that is. Now, the G20 countries, among others, have committed themselves to share 2.5 billion doses until the end of the year, or mid-2022, rather. But right now, uh, we've only shared, or they've only shared 605 million doses. We're far behind the 2.5 billion. So the low-income uh, countries, the stock of vaccines is getting lower and lower. In South Africa, only 24% of the population has been entirely vaccinated, whereas the country has already used 99% of the doses that are available. Talking about that uh, inequality, inequality in one, we always say no one of us is safe until everyone is safe. And in that framework, almost half of the world population that we're talking 3.8 billion people in low income countries particularly have not been vaccinated at all. And this is the reason why one of our main commitment is the sharing of doses. So it's true that we're talking here of boosters. Now the number of boosters here is six times higher than the number of first time doses of vaccine in Africa. And we want to, to, to close that gap. And this is uh, we support of course the financing of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerated Act. This is a cooperation mechanisms that the objective of which is to accelerate the design and the delivery of vaccines uh, uh, to fight against COVID-19 and to ensure a fair and universal access to those vaccines. It's a mechanism that, that uh, France has already financed uh, a year ago, so uh, a few months after uh, the virus or the pandemic uh, uh, affected us. We also call for the waiving the temporary lift of uh, the IPRs of the intellectual property rights on uh, vaccines. So those are rights uh, for a company or an individual that has created something. So the creator has exclusive right on the use of its creation for a certain period of time. In Sanofi, for instance, they created, let's say, a formula for the vaccine. Well, if they are the creator, well, they uh, Ha, are the owners of all the rights and I don't have to share it with anyone but this is a blockage or this is an obstacle to progress and this is a, a, an obstacle to resolving the crisis caused by the pandemic um, and of course this is also linked to the item four the transfer of technology so the objective is to make sure that 70 percent of the low-income countries population be vaccinated until uh, September or by September 2022. And you can help us. You can go on our website and sign our petition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Oleima and Shaima, for the, the presentation. I think it really gives uh, food for discussions now. So um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to, to the Q&A to open the session, the Q&A session. I will try to share them one slide so that we have it as background. If you give me just one second. Okay, so you see the name of all our speakers today. If you wish to ask a question, you can, uh, I remind you, you can raise your hand and uh, say to whom you're asking the question and ask it live, or you can also use the Q&A. And in that case, I also invite you to indicate who you're asking the question to. Um, I will start with a question of my own. Um, so, as already said, I think it's, um, I think the initiatives that we're presenting uh, are very uh, encouraging uh, and it's really nice to see how, uh, how the youth mobilizes on, on such important topics as the ones that we mentioned. We mentioned mental health, uh, we mentioned uh, uh, vaccine, vaccines, COVID vaccines, um, but uh, at the beginning of the conference, Louise mentioned that uh, more than a third of the world's population um, lacks full coverage of essential health services. And every year, 100 million people fall into extreme poverty because of out-of-pocket health costs. So it's really a big challenge that we're facing. And I don't think that only one generation can fix it, uh, I, I can face that challenge. I really think that it requires intergenerational uh, collaboration and intergenerational solidarity. And I, I haven't heard a lot about intergenerational cooperation. So that would be my, my question to, to all the, the speakers today. So 
is your uh, organization uh, looking at uh, intergenerational solidarity or cooperation? Are you carrying out any actions to, uh, to boost intergenerational contacts? Uh, so that would be my question. And I would like to ask the question first to, to Daniela, as you were the first to speak. So. Bueno. Thank you. Well, intergenerational collaboration is um, something very interesting to us. We, in our organization, which was created in 1991, we look into the statistics and we see that most of our associates are older um, are thir of 30 years or older. And this is why we always reflect on how to uh, attract younger people. And we do this through the LIFE project. We try to encourage young people to join our mutuals and become affiliates so that we can develop projects, youth projects for the future. We try to invite the youth to our programs. We give them different courses on the social economy, for instance. And it, this serves as a way to involve younger people into the organization, into health, pro, um, health programs and social development product, projects. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Daniela, uh, for, for your answer. Um, and um, I look at the Geneva Youth Forum now. Do, is this also um, a, a topic that you are uh, tackling? Yeah, sorry. Yes, of course it is. Um, uh, actually, what has been proposed for, for um, since now is good, but not perfect. Otherwise, we we would have solved that. And it's not a critic at all because I think it's really complex issues. But it also means that it's not enough, and that we still need to work on it. So that's where we we think that uh, youth mind and new perspective can help, but we cannot do it alone because we don't have the experience, the expertise, the knowledge. So that's why we need this interaction between youth and experts or people that already know the context so that we will bring the best of the two generations. And I think that as, as soon as we will try to isolate ourselves, we will fail because it's together that we built a strong system that is uh, that has a general view and that can really strive. Try. Emma, do you want to add anything? No, I completely agree. <laughs> Okay, I'll have a follow up question, but I'll keep it for later. I just want to continue on intergenerational solidarity with uh, with one maybe um, because all your I mean, uh, all your organizations are really uh, focused on on youth and on involving youth. Um, so do you in one also involve older generations in your uh, project or your cause? Alors, euh, oui, totalement, parce que je pense que le, la personne la plus jeune avec laquelle on coopère, je pense, c'est Emmanuel Macron. Yes, indeed, because the youngest person we work with is Emmanuel Macron. All the others are 40, 50, 60 years old or more. So we experience that intergeneration relationship on a daily basis. We have to convince MPs who do not necessarily have the same view of things as us to join us. Shaima, perhaps you want to add something? Yes, we are a group of young people beyond borders, beyond age, we try and uh, uh, defend universal values and uh, we uh, bring in the voice of those uh, who support our campaigns, whether they are 15 years old or 70 years old. It is uh, an idea that uh, can involve everybody. So I think that we have uh, such a, a universal approach. The idea is to enable young people to find their place in the world that they want to create, uh, unlike the political world where you have older people, where the young are not really involved. So this is uh, uh, what uh, 
uh, is embodied by the Youth Ambassadors uh, Programme, but we want to involve everybody. Thanks, sorry, I was muted. So, um, yes, uh, coming back to the Geneva Youth Forum um, and the uh, concrete, so you, you mentioned that it's, uh, that we need concrete acting and uh, get away of the, uh, the more general uh, inspirational speaking um, and get to the concrete uh, actions. And you mentioned this wheel, so the solution wheel, which I find mm -hmm. actually very interesting. And I think it's also, that solution wheel can also allow for this intergenerational cooperation in the implementation of, of what you're trying to reach. Um, so I had a, I would like to have maybe if if you can share a concrete example of how that wheel that wheel works, uh, how that wheel was applied. Okay, um, a concrete example of how it was applied. We don't have it in, um, yet because we didn't ha um, have our first assembly yet. It will be in April 2022, but I can have a theoretical example. Uh, it will be about environment, and I know that um, in Kenya there was a little boy that had the idea of creating a tool that was that um, that could enable to wash hands without touching the tool. So, and he was only 11 years old. So it was a really good idea in this um, in this time of pandemic and where we were touching everything. And I was thinking. We could use that as a problem. The problem would be a sanitary problem and the fact that we are touching things that are just spreading the virus. And then this could be the solution that we would put in the wheel of solution. And that can be either applied at the government level because they think that it's a good solution or at the community level in a village or even in a house finding this solution and thinking we are going to create this tool because it helps us uh, getting away from this virus. So we are go going to collect all these amazing ideas that, that are just need to be realized because they are here to make them happen. Emma, do you wanna say something about that? Do you have another idea? I can't come up with another example, um, but I think that the idea of the um, charter will become much more concrete um, once we work on the assembly, which as Eva said uh, right before, will be on the theme of the environment. So there are so many ideas that can be spoken of and um, I'm really excited to, to participate. I think it's, a, it's very uh, promising that there's a lot of work ahead. I think to gather all those uh, concrete solutions, it's, it's a huge work, so good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, and definitely, all... <laughs> thank you. We will all be uh, interested in hearing uh, about the results and, and seeing the wheel once it starts working and, and how it applies. And it's very interesting. Um, I, I look at the public um, in the audience. So um, is there any question or anyone wishes to take the floor? Maybe you were inspired uh, by one um, of the presentations. I see that uh, we have comments. We have some comments uh, from... Um, people wanting to be invited to the assembly. Um, is that possible? It is, of course, and we want people to come. Uh, the very first thing you could do just to make you visible is go on our, our website and share your ID. And so if your ID is really great, of course, you, you will be invited to the assembly. If you can come in person, and we hope that we can do it in person, but we never know with this virus, you can come in person. And if not, you can all also um, uh, follow it uh, virtually because it will be hybrid, uh, both in person, if we can, and virtual. And there is no limit for the virtual version for now. Okay, I see. I think we have a hand raised from uh, Elisa. Is Elisa still there? No? Hola, hola, hola. Ah, sí. yeah. Hello? Sí. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I would like to thank you for this space. And obviously, I support uh, what all these uh, young people are doing. I am uh, very surprised by the intervention, but we see 
that uh, we insist in the future and present of uh, youth. I think that it is uh, very important. Nobody can better work on youth than the youth uh, itself. Uh, the from the social and health systems, uh, any standard uh, can be planned, any access uh, structure, any sort of regulation and processes. But if we are not aware of youth and if youth uh, doesn't understand the the real reasons for self-care, well, we wouldn't establish a healthy generational continuity. In our case, um, in relation with the health management, it's something that we want to insist. And I've seen it in all the interventions. We've seen the engagement. I'm so pleased uh, to listen to you. You're so clear in the three presentations. There is a lot of clarity, and I would like to take advantage uh, to insist on that. I'm surprised about something. They're all girls. There is an um, inequality of gender. And we should also work on that issue. So greetings. Uh, and I w wanted just to uh, greet you from Colombia and all my support uh, to what I've heard and uh, seen. Future events. It is true. It was not uh, made on purpose. We have only women today. It's usually the other way around. So I think that for once, it's not a big problem that we are only <laughs> uh, women represented, but we will uh, make sure to have gender equity for future events for sure. I think the, the point that made by Elisa about um, well, about uh, creating also uh, literacy um, in, in younger generation, health literacy, uh, underlying the importance of looking after one, one's own health, uh, is key and related to that also digital literacy and actually when I first heard about that uh, online platform um, about the fact that well most uh, many of your initiatives I think at the Geneva Youth Call and also at one um, and more and more for all all of us are online and uh, the truth is that uh, so digital solutions have a, a big potential but they also carry out the risks of not reaching uh, more vulnerable groups that can uh, be left outside. So um, my question be, would be on that actually, is digital literacy uh, something that you are working on or that you are trying to improve uh, amongst youth? Uh, so I know that, uh, Daniela, I know that you are doing a lot on health literacy, we've heard on reproductive health, but is the digital uh, component of that, is that something you already uh, include or not? No, it's one of the, um, the tasks um, that is still pending. I take a note. I think that these actions uh, should be taken by the state uh, with the Ministry of Education so that uh, from the beginning of life, from primary school, to make aware young people of a healthy life of style or style of life rather not to eat uh, sugars for example these are the tiny things that we can um, do to improve our style of life uh, but regarding uh, digital literacy we're not focused on that task but we will start and we will learn from the different initiatives. Regarding literacy, health literacy, it's definitely a, a cross-sectorial responsibility. The educational sector still has, definitely has a big role to play. But um, to get back to the, the digital, I was wondering whether one, uh, th that is something that one is, is looking at. I know it's maybe a bit uh, far from the concretely, specifically health related, but I still think it's linked so maybe uh, Omeima or Shaima, you could uh, answer or give us your, your thoughts on that. 
Euh, oui, euh, nous, c'est euh, compris du coup dans, voilà. nos, euh, dans nos campagnes de plaidoyer. Well, indeed, it is part of our advocacy campaigns. We have a task force which works on the uh, Europe and Africa partnership. And amongst our priorities, we have uh, the digital skills for young people in the most uh, rural areas to have a greater access, perhaps particularly during the pandemic. Otherwise, uh, whole sectors of uh, uh, people would have been excluded from health uh, education. <laughs> so, no, I don't want to speak because uh, Shaiman said it all. The importance of digital uh, solutions to access, in some cases, to access uh, essential uh, services. Like uh, we've had the pleasure. I, I mean, here um, I live in Belgium, and we had teleconsultations again uh, um, during the the pandemic, which was really useful. Um, and I see for the Geneva Youth Call, you have this platform on which uh, I understand that you mostly rely. So uh, when having a look at the initiative, I was wondering what about those youth, young people who maybe have no access to that. Are you doing anything in that regard? So the digital access and use is one of our themes. Of, of course, it's uh, as important uh, as health in our um, perspective. But uh, we have to be aware that uh, more and more youth, our young people, are um, have access to a digital um, platform. I know that the lowest rate of a phone by 100 inhabitants in the world is 45. So it means, and that's for the whole population, including all person. So we know that more and more youth have access to uh, to digital facilities. That's a, that's the first point. But I think that it's not only about access. It's also about use because. First of all, they, they are, there is a, a, a use that is not in, uh, adequate for health, and then it can create addiction and all, everything that we know about that. But we have seen it with the pandemic. If we don't use it well, we we don't get the right information, and it can have a great risk on our health directly as well. So I think that it's always really related to uh, to environment, to health. We can always link to this um, these themes together and. Uh, it is something that we are looking at, and it's really important. Uh, I missed something. In our health focus, we do it digitally. We have access uh, to e-medicine, all the health services, uh, available to the users of our um, services, uh, we can do it through e-health. And we are focusing on rural areas, uh, uh, areas that do not have good roads, uh, even to get there physically. And um, for you, it would be strange, but in Latin America, it happens. Uh, the animals are still a uh, means of transport, a horse uh, or a donkey. I don't know whether donkey translates. Yes, it does. Um, is used uh, to get to a place uh, which is uh, far away. So we, we do have these tasks of e-health, uh, e-consultation. In, in what we call sometimes medical deserts is, is also essential. Um, I see that we have a hand raised apparently from Aura of Gestar uh, Salud. Aura, if you wish, you, you can take the floor. Is Aura still there? Aura. Je crois que la question a été posée sur le chat. I think the question was raised in the chat. Allô, me oyez? Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Eh, bueno, lo mío más que una pregunta es un comentario. It's more a comment than a question. I think it's important to bear in mind that regarding the in generational integration, a family is the best example of that uh, integration that should guide the actions of being young. In all families, uh, we have young people, older people, uh, children, and we have uh, gender equality. And that uh, cross uh, through the families, we could enlarge it. Looking at the territory where all the generations uh, confront uh, common situations uh, and uh, without leaving aside uh, the specificities of each uh, generation, we should bear in mind what integrates us, uh, family and territory. Uh, at least in, in Europe, is that uh, the family, the traditional family model has a bit disappeared, uh, which is why uh, many people who are aging uh, might end up uh, without uh, relatives to look after them, for example. And, and that is why we have to look at other ways of boosting intergenerational cooperation and solidarity for our social protection systems, for example, to be uh, resilient and to be, uh, to be sustainable for, for the future. So it's definitely um, a key challenge also for, for, our, um, for our societies for the years to come. Um, I, I would like to, I'm checking just the chat to see if I have uh, other questions. Um, let me see, or if anyone has raised their hand. Um, we would like to know how to have our, oh, how, uh, so I have a question, well, more of a comment question from Diana Traude. Um, I will uh, try to translate it. So we'd like to know how uh, we can collaborate with your organizations. Um, so uh, they are an organization from Mali, an organization, a women organization in Mali, and they would like to know how they can collaborate with your uh, organizations. And this is more for the international, uh, Organizations of one and for the Geneva Youth Call. So maybe we can start with uh, with one. How can they um, contact you? How can they collaborate with you? First of all, it would be great if you could support our campaign, uh, if, which is on our site. And then we can have some contact through the chat and then we'll uh, transfer it to uh, those who are responsible. And for the Geneva Youth Call, how can they uh, be active? Maybe Emma, you want to go ahead? Let me answer. I think that the best way uh, to contact us, us is to show how creative you are by uh, giving a contribution on our site, by providing a solution. And of course, you can always uh, contact us by mail or on the internet uh, site. And I've given details on the chat. you are doing can also be replicated in other areas. So how can they collaborate with you if they're interested? Obviously, I will put in the chat our website, our social network, so, so you can follow us, so you can see what we do. And I will be in contact, I can tell you more about what we do, how we do it. I can visit you. I will tell you everything and we can work together. 
Yes, thank you all. Thank you all uh, for, for sharing your experience, for being open to collaborate with, uh, with the participants uh, for future initiatives. I hope that you are all inspired by the presentations that you've seen. We've reached the end of our Q&A. Actually, it went pretty fast. Um, I would like uh, after this to have a quick poll. I will ask you one more question. Uh, so let me see my slide. So you see on your screen um, the translation of those questions that they will appear in English on your screen. So here are the translations in French and Spanish. I give you a bit of time to read that. I would like to know how you feel after such uh, interesting exchanges. Uh, do you feel impressed by the uh, actions that were presented? Do you feel inspired to take action? Are you hopeless in face of the many challenges that remain to be tackled? Or are you hungry? Uh, you could really use uh, some real cookies rather than the virtual ones. Anyone else can, can answer? We have a few answers. But it's good to see already that most of you are impressed and inspired. So a lot of optimism, optimism for the future. No one is hungry. So we had a good lunch, <laughs> all of you. I think we can end the poll. So impressed and inspired. That's what we take home with us. <laughs> um, OK, well. I'm glad to read that. And I would like now to give the floor to Aurora for the conclusion. So she will, Aurora um, Iradugunda from the ILO, she will present the conclusions of the Global Social Protection Report 2020 2022. And she will also highlight the role of younger generations in the implementation of the recommendations uh, included in that report. So, uh, Aurora, thanks a lot for participating. And I give you now the floor. Merci, uh, Jessica. Yes, just... thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jessica. I'm going to share my screen with you, if I may. There we go. So, can you see my screen? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the network for the invitation for the invitation. And thank you very much to all those young people who have shown all this initiative. This is really encouraging to see a very uh, engaged young people. I am myself young um, and I'm really, really pleased to be able to be part of this webinar to share with you the conclusions of the world report. Um, uh, or the World Social Protection uh, Report, but also the role of uh, young people for the implementation of uh, universal health coverage, UHC. What's the uh, uh, World Social Protection Report uh, 2022 uh, of the LO? It is uh, indeed a report that gives you uh, an overview of the recent development in the social protection systems, uh, the social protection uh, flaws, and the life cycle. Also, the impact on the pandemic of, of uh, COVID-19, but also we talk about political recommendations and the, re the way to reach SDG, uh, uh, the SDGs, among other stages, is three on social protection. What is the uh, social protection in health? It is uh, indeed an approach uh, based on rights, the objective of which is universal health coverage. Um, so you have a whole series of public uh, measures or publicly organized measures in the aim to have effective access to quality health care without any kind of difficulty and revenue security to compensate the loss of revenue in case of, uh, for instance, uh, disease. Now, the social protection in health is also a uh, part and parcel of the corpus of human rights and international standards on social security. And there are several principles, uh, uh, for instance, universal access, non-discrimination, solidarity, et cetera, et cetera. So social protection in health is very important for the implementation of uh, the uh, right to health and uh, social protection. It is a tool in order uh, to make sure that all people have access to health services that they need when and where they need without financial hardship. 
Now, very briefly, I would like to describe the different dimensions of UHC. Uh, so, uh, first of all, it's very important to cover these three dimensions. First of all, population, who is covered? The aim being to cover the largest number of uh, uh, people, and then the services, that's the second dimension, and also the financial uh, uh, coverage uh, to cover the cost of services uh, and the part that people have to pay from their own pockets. And there is a distinction to be made between the legal coverage and the effective coverage. And now the legal coverage, as the name says it, is in the fact simply that you are registered in uh, the national uh, legal, uh, or that you have, at least in the national uh, frameworks, the legal frameworks, uh, this right that is enshrined. The effective coverage means that in reality, you have the right that is covered. Now, very often in countries you have a legal coverage, but this legal coverage does not entail in many countries that you have effective coverage. And this is the reason why we make that distinction. Maybe the population is not aware of its right to uh, coverage, uh, and so they cannot exercise the rights. So there are barriers to uh, health care. For instance, the quality is a barrier, the physical distance to have access to healthcare, the costs that need to be covered for those uh, healthcare, for healthcare, uh, the availability. As regards the effective coverage, the uh, World Report says that. Uh, about two thirds of the world population is protected by social protection, health social protection schemes, but there are still major inequalities. And if you look at, at uh, the situation, for instance, sub Saharan Africa, only 15.7% of the population and 23.4% in South Asia, 23.4% uh, of uh, people are covered. So we have around 2.7 billion people without any kind of coverage in the world. So there are several options obstacles. Um for instance, very, very high direct payments. Uh, we've said it before in this webinar, more than 100 million people find themselves in extreme poverty because of costs related to their healthcare. There's a lack of availability of healthcare in many countries, especially for the low and medium income countries. There are geographical inequalities. And then of course, there's underinvestment in social protection in health, but also there is a lack of a universal right to social protection and therefore there is no effective coverage. So what to do to extend the coverage? And uh, well, in the uh, report, there are uh, key success factors. For instance, a major political will for instance, by means of higher investments in health as social protection, but also the fact that within the legal frameworks in the countries where that does that right is not enshrined, enshrining that right, good governance, uh, financially, operationally, but also a uh, an active participation of uh, all members of society through an efficient social dialogue and communication and awareness raising to rights for the whole of population of the populations just to make sure that everyone knows how to exercise their rights to have access to healthcare. They have a right to healthcare, which is a nice segue for my next point, the culture of uh, social protection. A culture of social protection is indeed absolutely essential for the implementation of these key success factors. What is a, a social protection culture? It's creating a situation in which a population, a given population, population knows how social protection systems work, what its founding values are, but they also know their rights uh, to social protection and know how to exercise their rights. It's a situation in which uh, people uh, can take part, active part in the design of uh, social protection systems. Now, the ILO believes that people that are well informed about their rights will be more proactive and they'll be able to exercise their rights and will be able to take part in the design of such systems. So to make sure that they have a system that responds to the real needs of the whole of the population. So build a social a health social protection culture. So 
uh, who is covered by that? Uh, well, it's a business. We are all concerned by that business, not just uh, uh, political uh, or decision makers or, or the social partners as well, the partners of our civil society, among whom young people. Well, uh, how can you start creating this uh, culture of social protection? Well, the creation of uh, this culture is indeed a, a process that is specific to each country. So there is no one size fit or uh, model. But the ILO has identified uh, three means uh, by means of education, by means of communication and uh, awareness, reasons uh, to rights, but also capacity building for the staff of the social protection institutions, and also capacity building for the policymakers uh, uh, by means of education. The ILO says that the countries that have uh, managed to extend uh, the social protection to a majority of the population have indeed beforehand implemented education programs for the whole of the population. This is the case, for instance, in Uruguay, with the uh, uh, education program aimed uh, at making sure that the whole population knows uh, their rights. Uh, so the whole uh, the whole population was covered. Uh, so you have to know that more than 80% of the population in Uruguay is affiliated to one or the other protect social protection system. So you see how uh, the creation of a culture is directly linked to the coverage in uh, a given country, but also capacity building for the staff. While creating this culture, I think it's important also because you can really share the values, the founding values of social protection, so that this translates in social protection systems that are fair, that are uh, sustainable, and that really promote the values and principles that I've talked about, universal access, non-discrimination, solidarity, et cetera, et cetera. And if you allow me, I would like to dwell on the importance of young people. As was said before, uh, during this webinar, more than 40% of the world population uh, is uh, under 25 years of age uh, in 2018. In Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, it's more than 60% actually of the population. So of course, young people have a role to play in this movement and in this culture of social protection in health. And it's all the more true that the younger generations will have to be faced to different uh, changes uh, uh, in terms of climate, in terms of pandemics, for instance, and which will have an impact on their health and which already have a severe impact on their health, especially in low income countries, which have been impacted by climate change indeed. So uh, it's important to recognize the role of young people in the decision-making process. This is a key factor so as to make sure that we have a social protection systems that respond to the specific needs of that uh, uh, population group, uh, which represents more than 40% of the world population. It's not a small, uh, group. It's also important to lay emphasis on the youth uh, participation because this is important for capacity building for future political leaders in terms of uh, social protection in many countries, especially in low income countries. Uh, and those countries where have uh, health uh, social protection si systems that are not uh, really developed, well, there is a lack of uh, uh, technical capacities as regards to implementation of such systems. So education by means of technical trainings or study programs can contribute to developing local expertise and reduce uh, the reliance on external uh, donors or external aid in many countries. And this also allows those countries uh, to build systems that really, as I said before, respond to the local realities and local needs. It's not always the case in uh, countries that really depend on external aid. An example is uh, the Connect platform in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, with the support of the ILO, Connect works towards uh, UHC. 
and it launched a special a master program on uh, health and social protection in Thailand in the University of Maidol. Uh, let's talk about the regional strategy for social protection in Africa of the ILO, which was launched uh, recently in 2021. And uh, the aim is the same. So the ILO believes that by means of these initiatives, we can all indeed uh, make sure that we create a, a social protection culture for a society where everybody takes ownership of the values of uh, social protection for the good implementation of social protection systems in health, uh, responding to the needs of each and every one, men and women. And let me finish by uh, perhaps um, sharing with you a theory of change uh, for social change by means of youth. Uh, this is a model that uh, has been put together by a Canadian NGO, Apathy is Boring, it's called, and they work with young people, and I, I work for several years for Apathy is Boring, and they put up together a model that allows us to really perhaps work within a social movement, a given social movement. So they uh, have, they put together uh, three categories of uh, global changers, uh, so to speak, or uh, uh, change drivers. So we've got the first category called the shakers. So what are the shakers? This is the group that is really raising awareness among society on a particular problem. Uh, for instance, somebody who's organizing or who's presenting something during a uh, demonstration, taking part in a raise awareness campaign. So you've got the shakers and you've got the makers. They come up with practical, innovating solutions to certain problems by means, for instance, of uh, the launching of a project, the setting up of an uh, innovating body, uh, uh, the launching of a digital application. And the third group, the uptakers. Now, who are the uptakers? The ones who are going to take up the inf the information, the solutions uh, put together by the first two groups and convey them to the decision makers. So they work on making sure that institutions adopt these solutions, but uptakers can also be political leaders and decision makers. And so basically they are mobilized by means of votes and of course, representing young people uh, in the uh, institutions or by means of the work of advocacy with other political leaders. So what's interesting is that uh, the initiatives that we've heard about today are indeed can be ventilated according to this model. Uh, there was a lot of awareness, readiness, uh, the launching of projects of programs, but there's a lot of work of advocacy towards decision makers and elected representatives. So of course, uh, uh, you see those three projects can be put in each one of these uh, categories. I like this model because it allows you to position yourself in a given social movement, but also to understand that we all have a role to play. Perhaps you feel more comfortable with raise awareness campaigners, or you're more of a creator, or you're more uh, of an uptaker because you like politics. Everyone can find their place in this model. And this is what I invite you to do. Find your place in that model, especially towards young people who are listening to us today. Please find your place in your model and, 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 and act accordingly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Jose, for your presentation. So indeed, we all have a, a role to play. Uh, we can choose either by being uh, shakers, makers, or uptakers. Um, I see that from the figures that, that you um, mentioned, so about effective coverage, they, there is indeed a huge gap between high income, and low income countries, but also within you mentioned that there are uh, inequalities also within countries themselves. Uh, so there is a big room uh, for improvement. There is room for action. Uh, we will, uh, I think, from all our organizations, uh, continue acting for universal healthcare coverage, either by advocating for that necessary political will that you were highlighting, or for um, the good governance also, more transparency. Um, also calling for participation of all generations, being young or old, um, to be to have them included in the social dialogue, as you mentioned, and it was mentioned also before that uh, nearly half of the population is young, so they have all their right. I mean, they, they are rightfully they need to be included in decision making as well. And uh, we'll also continue, I think, communicating and raising awareness on universal healthcare coverage. I think the event of the Rezo of the network today is one example of what can be done, um, and we'll contribute that way also to build that social protection culture. And I think the involvement of youth in building that culture is really essential. So um, with, with this in mind, 
um, we will uh, close uh, this event. I want to thank once more Daniela, Emma, um, Eva, Shaima, uh, Omeima and Aurore, all of you for taking the floor today, for sharing your experience. It's been very, uh, very interesting, very interesting discussions. I want to thank also the Réseau for inviting me to, to moderate the event. So Chloe, Louise and Mathias too. And uh, finally, I want to thank the translators as well, because thanks to them, we could all speak uh, many languages today. So thanks to, to all the translators for, for their work and for making the event possible. Uh, thanks also to participants uh, for taking part to the event. And I hope to see you all soon and to be able to share more uh, examples like the ones that were shared today. Thanks to all and have a good afternoon. Thank you.